Welcome, everybody. We've got a little uh, family reunion happening here um, for Music Industry Forum this week. Um, Reed's the connection. Many of y'all know Reed as one of your classmates. And I just found out the other day that her uncle, Patterson Hood, is in the drive-by truckers, and that her grandfather, David Hood, um, is, is a swamper. So I'm going to actually we're going to pretend people don't have any context and know what that means. So Patterson, I'll let you go first. Give us your, your good 32nd, all the cool <laughs> stuff you do description. Oh man. Oh, well, uh, before all this happened, <laughs> we, uh, uh, I play in a band called drive by truckers. We, uh, will be turning 25 this June as a band. And, uh, we've, I think just put out our 13th studio album, Plus we have a few live albums and side projects and I've got three solo records. And um, I also do writing, freelance writing of uh, op-eds and essays and whatever else, and uh, maybe someday a book. So that's pretty much it for me. Writing in the in music space or broader than that? All over. I, I, I wrote an op-ed uh, about uh, I'm actually about taking down the Confederate flag for the New York Times a few years ago. And uh, I just recently, uh, I think it's coming out any day now, Oxford American has an essay I wrote about growing up in Muscle Shoals, Alabama and being that guy's son. And uh, so, uh, uh, so it's, you know, I, I write about all, over, all, all kinds of stuff, a lot of political stuff and a lot of music stuff. Cool, well, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. So if we move up a square on the Zoom here, David Hood is a, a bass player and a, a swamper, member of the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section. So for the people who don't know, David, what's that mean? Well, uh, me and three of my partners uh, started, we, we were recording at Fame Recording Studios in Muscle Shoals and, and another studio uh, that belonged to a fellow named Quinn Ivy. And uh, we became a rhythm section by working together quite a bit, cutting records. And the first record that I played on that I got actually paid union scale was uh, um, Percy Sledge's Warm and Tender Love, which was the follow up to When a Man Loves a Woman. And uh, I played on most of Percy's record after that, but that was the first one. And I think I made $59 or something like that, but that was what union scale, scale was in 1966. This was May 15th, 1966. And uh, I, after three years, we, the, my partners and I bought a studio, a, a, a small studio in Muscle Shoals and Im improved it, made it an eight track, which was improving it. It was four track when we first went there and uh, started recording with, you know, we decided well, we were going to be the Muscle Shoals rhythm section and not go anywhere and record with anybody else. They'd have to, people would have to come to us. And uh, having played on, by that time, having played on several hit records with people like Aretha Franklin and Wilson Pickett and Percy Sledge and Bobby Womack, and all these rhythm and blues artists, uh, we, we, our first big act to come to Muscle Shows at our studio was Cher. Uh, Jerry Wexler from Atlantic Records brought Cher to do her first solo project. Sonny was there, but Jerry locked him out of the studio <laughs> because he didn't want any interruption. But uh, that, was, that wasn't a hit record, but it was the start of our studio and uh, our business. Uh, I think probably the more famous of the very early stuff that we did but th that wasn't a hit was uh, Boss Skaggs' uh, Loan Me a Dime that had Dwayne Allman playing on it. And now it's become, I guess, a iconic song, even though it probably sold two records or something. But it, it it's very famous because it's of Dwayne. And uh, yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I did. You gave me that record, and right, for favorites. Christmas one day. <laughs> Yeah, and we, yeah. we recorded several things that were hits after that. Uh, I guess the first hit we cut in our studio was "Take a Letter, Maria" by R.B. Greaves, and that's a you know it's. <laughs> I'm, I know I'm talking to people who are in their late teens or early twenties. This was in 1969, 70, somewhere along there. So it's a these are very oldie, goldie records to the 
people that are our audience. But we've, yeah, we. But since you then, we besides still like them. the ones I've already mentioned, we were <laughs> recorded with uh, uh, gosh, Simon Paul Simon Art Garfunkel. Uh, we did the, their last record together. We did that. It's called My Little Town. Uh, we recorded with uh, Bob Seger, uh, probably four or five albums with Bob Seger, uh, Glenn Fry of the Eagles. Uh, gosh, I may need a little help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Staple Singers, I'll Take You There. Yeah. Respect Yourself. And... Uh, yeah, I toured with traffic, you and I just by eh? coincidence today I got a, a, a thing on Facebook. It was a video that we did in 1973 in Germany with traffic, and we were playing. And I, I never, I had never seen it. Uh, wow. there, I haven't either. I, I, I think I forwarded it to you. That um, actually segues really well. Um, if and if uh, for our audience, if you want to check out the context of this, there's a great movie called Muscle Shoals that talks about sort of that whole scene and uh, and Mr. Hood is, is featured in it. Um, it gives some good background. And there's a quote in that movie where you talk about after being on the road with traffic, not really wanting to travel, you're like, people can just come here. We have a thing that people want and they they can come to us. So you sort of made a decision not to travel a lot. And interestingly, right. your son Patterson made his band very successful by being on the road all the time. All the time. <laughs> right. And so I'm curious how the family dynamic played around that. Like Patterson, did you make that choice based on having seen the other side of it or like, I mean, there's more to it. I mean, the simple answer is I wanted to see the world. I, I, I saw enough of muscle shoals growing up there and, and wanted to, wanted to see the rest of the world. But, uh, but I mean, a lot of it too is, I mean, I'm kind of in a, it's weird cause dad and I are in the same business, but we're in some ways we're in very different ends of it, you know? Right. And, uh, it, it, and so, uh, almost like opposite ends of a coin or something. So, uh, you know, I, I was always, a. a a performing musician and out playing and uh dad was extremely precise and meticulous you know get it right one take studio guy which is amazing and uh, uh I, I was a little more the punk rock aesthetic of you know plug it in turn it up get out there and you know shake your ass <laughs> and, right because when they're not recording it the audience only remembers what they feel like at the end of the gig they don't remember that note you missed on the second tune Right. And that note bothers me, you know, really. <laughs> that him crazy. I'm, no, I'm no fun playing live because I'm, I'm, I'm just concentrating and I want everything perfect. And it's impossible to make everything perfect. We would get things perfect one time in the recording studio and, and you only have to do it one. If you get it perfect that one time, you don't ever play it again. And uh, that was a strange thing. I have toured a few times. And it's, it's, it's almost like it's every 20 years. Uh, my involvement with traffic was in 72 and 73. And then about 20 years later, I did a blues tour in Europe with some blues artists. And uh, then 20 years after that, I did a, a, started playing with a group, an Irish group called the Water Boys. And I was in 18 different countries over a two and a half year period. And so I got my, my, seeing the world taken care of very, really quickly doing that. And I probably would have kept doing it a little bit longer, but I fell in my hotel room and broke my wrist, my left wrist. And so I couldn't play. I couldn't play, couldn't play for three months and it still bothers me. Uh, but I'm back working in the studio. Uh, it, the co coronavirus situation hadn't affected me as much uh, the people that i work with it is affected a lot because they can't tour they can't do anything but i'm you know i'm happy in the studio i just put a mask on and keep going that's the the one gig i've had since march was a recording session and the guy who runs this studio said i'm fine with the masks and if i never shake another hand it's cool with me he's a little bit of yeah. a germaphobe anyway i'm not so, i'm not fine with the mask because it fogs up my glasses but uh, <laughs> And in the studio, I can take, once we get in and get settled in our places, I can take the mask off because we're separated uh, right. by a good distance. 
So, Reed, did your family members try to talk you out of going into the music business? <laughs> so, when I first told them that I was going into the music business, I had just, uh, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a music industry major, like, like seventh grade, like I shadowed a lady who was managing at the time, Jason Isbell, and I shadowed her and I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. So I was like, okay, I'm really thinking about going into the music industry. And they were like, well, what part? Like, what do you, what do you want to do in the music industry? Cause I also was in band this time in high school. And I was like, oh, I want to go into like artist management and stuff. And they're like, oh, okay, okay. That's good. That's good. You can do that part. I, yeah. I told her early on, I thought she was a, a natural. I, I, yeah. I, uh, you know, you you still have to learn the stuff. You know, there's more more to it than just being a natural. But the parts of it you don't that you can't just learn or at least easily learn. She already had as far as the way her personality is and the way just her dynamic. And she grew up around the bit. She grew up around the two two polar different sides of the business and kind of saw a lot of that firsthand and uh i think she will always have a certain amount of empathy for the artist side of things because she grew up around us that's been my biggest thing recently is these people like i had this girl in one of my classes who was like oh it's okay all the artists make that money from spotify anyways and i was like no uh, i was like no, no. Well, one, be careful. She's probably going to have to watch this video. And two, somebody needs to explain that algorithm to her. Exactly. But I mean, okay, it's like, they don't, there's a lot of people just don't know. Yeah, I think uh, if things were like they are now, when I started, I probably would have stayed at the tire store working <laughs> with my father because you can't, it's hard to make it a living now. Exactly. You have, I mean, that Spotify, it's a joke. You exactly. don't make any money from that. Well, so actually, Daddy, I had a question about when you were starting out and kind of just being a part of like the Swampers and the, I know y'all did 3614 on y'all's own. What kind of was like your roles for yourself? Like what all did you have to do? Like you were a musician and like what else did you do while you were? Well, we, there, there are four of us in the rhythm section. Each took a little uh, job, I guess. Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, my partner who played rhythm guitar, was an excellent sound engineer. So he was the one who sort of kept the, st the studio going and, and got hired the first engineers and uh, different people. So he was the, the, the music business guy. Uh, Roger, the, dr the drummer, Roger Hawkins, uh, he and I more or less just did the played the drums and the bass, though I did book studio. Uh, when they would, somebody would call it a book studio time, I kept the book and I still have them all going back to in the early 60s. I kept the book from personally and for the studio. And it was, there were times when it never left my side. I, I had to have, I'd go to a movie, I had my book with me. Uh, that was actually, that was my next question. I heard now, I don't know if you told me or my mom told me, but I heard from someone that you kept like very detailed notes of like everything. Well, not really. Uh, I kept the book. Okay, but, uh, okay. but I wish I wish the notes were more detailed because now I'll go back and look to see, see what I did in 1975 or something. And I'll, I'll see where I put the musician's initials down. And there's something. Well, who was that? Who was S N? You know, because I, I would be writing it quick when I was doing it entering in the book i was writing booking the session and hiring the musicians and i wish i kept better notes i think it's impressive that you kept notes in general i know a lot of people who don't keep notes at all you know, it's, it's a it's a discipline that i learned out of necessity sure sure now uh on that too there's that little tidbit that you always tell in the swampers tour about kodachrome do you want to tell that story? Uh, what was the story? Uh, what? You know, you're uh, playing, and then that, the whole recording of it with Paul Simon, y'all had that, like, little bit at the end there that it's like. Oh, on Kodachrome, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we, he didn't come to record that song. He came to record a, a different song. Uh, he, the song on the same album is called Take Me to the Mardi Gras, and that's what he wanted to record. And uh, so we got, we got it, first or second take, got it really quickly, and he had booked four days' time. So then he started playing these other songs, and we said, well, yeah, we like that, and we like that. 
we don't usually get to do that. But he had the time and he had us hired, so he wanted to get his money's worth. And uh, on Kodachrome, that was a, probably a first or second take. And he, at the end of it, he goes, okay, and to make it stop and start another take. But we kept playing, and it just goes and goes and builds and builds. And so it turned out, even though he didn't think that was the take, it was the take. And so you, you hear him go, okay, on the, toward the, at the beginning of the fade. Right, and then it rocks out for a while after that. Not it's really. the good stuff that comes after that. And you're like, why would you stop it right there? <laughs> well, he thought he could do a better one, and he he didn't. He hadn't heard it yet, other than <laughs> just while we were recording. You know, you had, when you listen to things like that, you, you don't, when you're doing it, you don't really listen that well. You just try to get your part right and hope everybody else gets their part right. And uh, it's on reflection, on rehearing things that you then don't go, okay, well, that's, this is good or this is not good. But we've always been very, for one thing, we had to work quickly. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, it saves the musician, saves the uh, uh, artist money, saves the producer, saves everybody money. The, the quicker you can do it, then you can do more stuff. And uh, so we were, we, we got where we could get really good takes, first or second take, and we would go for that. We were quick learners. Yeah, we were quick learners. And we had a, 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 a chord chart system that we developed that uh, was using num numbers instead of the letters for like key of G or A or anything like that. If you use a number, then you if, if the artist says, well, this is too high or too low, the numbers don't change. And, and so you that that saves a lot of time and uh you know if you had to go rewrite everything that was you had written in c had to put it in g or f sharp or something you have to rewrite that whole thing again and we we just by using the numbers we don't have to do that is that similar like to the nashville number thing or do y'all yeah. have your special mus muscle shoals version well it was our version of it when i first heard the term national number system i said National number system. We've been doing that for years, and so I thought it was the Muscle Shoals number system. <laughs> yeah, I think Nashville did a good job of branding on that one. Yeah, they did, and they 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 really do it good up there too. I, I worked up there uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I worked up there with the William Lee Golden, who is with the Oak Ridge Boys, and he's the one. If you don't know who the Oak Ridge Boys, you see a picture of him, and he's the one with the long beard. <laughs> he looks like a mountain man. <laughs> and uh, and I, so I worked, it was me from Muscle Shows, but everybody else was a Nashville musician, and they are really good, but they're, they're great musicians, and they're really good with their charts, and they use the number system. Well, Muscle Shows has this interesting thing that is sort of halfway between Nashville and Memphis, and it seems like a little bit of best of both of those worlds. Yeah, that's, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe Nashville and Memphis just stole their good stuff from Muscle Shoals. That's possible, too. Totally. totally. I, so when we were preparing to do this, Reed and I were talking about things we wanted to make sure we talked about. And uh, Reed mentioned that she'd seen Patterson play probably 100 times and that he always tells stories as part of the gig. And that, like, he felt story. And I'm starting to understand where he gets his storytelling abilities from. Um. And this was actually on the thing for Reed to ask the question, but I stole it. So, and Patterson, you mentioned being a writer too. So how much does, do you view being a storyteller as like central to what you do as an artist? P pretty central. You know, I was a, I, I was a songwriter bef and, and before I was a musician, I, I, I kind of, I kind of came into it through the back door as far as, as a musician, I was, I was first a, a songwriter and I, I started writing songs when I was eight years old. And at that time I couldn't, my hands weren't big enough to make a chord. I couldn't play guitar. And, uh, and so, uh, it was really around 14 that I started playing guitar and I really first started playing guitar because I, I needed an outlet for these songs. By that time I'd written hundreds of songs. I would sit in, in class when I was supposed to be listening to the teacher or studying and I would write songs instead, which if you look at my report cards, <laughs> You can you can pinpoint exactly when I started writing songs <laughs> because my I went from being an A B student to a C D student and uh, like 
like that, basically. And uh, and so I, I was uh, at around 14. It's like, God, I, I, I need to learn how to play an instrument so I can do something with all these songs I've written. And uh, it didn't really occur to me that I, I thought someone else would sing them because I didn't think I had a voice because I, I don't have what you would call a technically you know, wonderful singing voice by any stretch. And, uh, but at some point after being in bands for a while, it, it, I saw that nobody wanted to sing my song. So I <laughs> thought, well, I better learn how to do that now because no one else is going to sing these damn things. So I, I, so it's been a work in progress trying to learn to be a decent singer. And, uh, and I think only in the last really probably 10 years I've gotten pretty decent at it. But uh, so there's a lot of early records that when I hear them, I just go, uh, <laughs> I can't believe I sang that bad. But um, um, so, it, so it's always, it, it's always been kind of to serve the song and even our band. I mean, I'm surrounded by musicians who, you know, are, are greater musicians than I am. All, all, all the other guys in my band are like just incredible players. And, uh, but, uh, and, and I, you know, so so I, I just want to I, I want to not let them down. I want to be good enough to where they're not embarrassed to be playing on stage with me. And uh, but even, but but part of what makes those guys such good players is they all have the attitude that is to serve the song. Like nobody in my band wants to showboat. Or you know, if anything, it's it's like you know, cool. You should play a little more there or something because he's not wanting to step on the song. And, that, and that's kind of the, the working uh, motto of the band is song is king. And uh, so we, you know, everything we do is to serve the song, which in that regard, I guess is kind of parallel to what dad did. Yeah. Um, and song, song is king. I mean, uh, you got to have a great song before you can have a great record or, or anything and 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 your st storytelling is the, the best part of your writing to me your stories are so good and bizarre sometimes and funny sometimes and uh, shocking sometimes and that's the thing that catches people's ear is what makes a, a great song well that's what i was telling jeff when we were going over the stuff for this he was talking about like what what was so like you know, like the big things about my uncle, like big topics we could talk about here. And I was like, well, I was like, I think it's impressive that every time I go to one of his shows, one of his, you know, it's rather it be a solo show or a DBT show, is that he always tells a story that I've never heard. And at this point in my life, I'm like 20 years old. I've been going to his shows like my entire life. And I, he's still telling me stories that I've never heard before. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, I could watch two back-to-back -back shows and he'd tell a story both times that I'd never heard before. And I'm like, this is crazy. Maybe <laughs> he's just waiting for you to get older to tell you the good stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is he? It's like my grandma well, you know, I... told me she knows the recipe, but then she keeps adding stuff every time I try and make the recipe. But uh, so no, actually, uh, Tio Pat, on your next part, our next little bit is talking about like being an Americana artist. And like what it's how that kind of term kind of fills in your band as well as like fits among like what it's like to be an Americana artist per se among these other artists or, like, or even how we use that word in terms of genre exactly you right. yeah you know I, I consider I consider us a rock and roll band and uh, you know if 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 we can if if we can sell more records or have more people come see us by attaching some other title to it i'm i guess i'm okay with that i mean i you know i like i like my peers as far as the other bands that are get called that uh it, it's on the on, funny thing about the americana thing when we first started the drive by truckers was kind of the dawning of that era you know it's like no depression magazine was yeah. kind of a hot new thing and uh Uncle Tupelo had had broken up and splintered into Wilco and Sunvolt, and they were kind of. And Steve Earle was, you know, kind of at his at his peak, you know, as far as being really kind of famous, as about as famous as he ever got. And Lucinda Williams put out Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, and all that was happening just as we were really starting the Drive By Truckers. And so it made sense to me. It's like, oh, okay, we're we'll kind of ride that train, you know, but but we weren't necessarily welcomed on that train initially we were kind of we were a little too little too uh, belligerent 
and a uh, little too punk rock, little little too this, a little too that, and um, and for a long time, a lot of the Americana purists kind of looked down their nose at what we did because we were too rowdy and and uh, uh, un- undisciplined, I guess, in their opinion, and um, you know, and and time as time goes on, things end up fitting better i mean you know we we've been nominated for awards for the americana music awards and we won one year and uh we've uh you know and so so it's all but we were always kind of little bit kept at a distance from that and of course after southern rock opera which is the record that kind of made us uh as famous as we ever got, you know, was was when that record came out. Then a lot of people wanted to call us Southern Rock, and and I cringed at that because I don't really consider us that either. You know, we made a record about that, but that's not really we're a rock and roll band. Rock and roll was born in the South, so you know, it's it's it, it doesn't it to me. It was always a little bit weird calling it Southern Rock. I mean, I, I think of Southern Rock as the, you know, beginning with the Allman Brothers and ending with Leonard Skinner and everything after that, I don't know. It, it was, a you know, I don't really consider us that. But. It's weird how we use these genre terms. Yeah. Sometimes they can enlighten us and sometimes they can like be really limiting. Right. And all the cool stuff is the stuff that happens in the cracks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, our band we've we've made at least three albums that I consider an attempt at power pop. I love power pop, and and uh, our keyboard player Jay Gonzalez is, is like an encyclopedia about that genre of music, and uh, uh, he's a master at it. And uh, you know, we've done three records that I I consider power pop, but no one ever calls us a power pop band, which is prop. Which probably says we don't do it good. Who is who is a power pop band? I mean, I think of like Big Star is like the ultimate power pop band. You know, all the all the bands that kind of continued on with the melodic thing that the Beatles were doing, but maybe applied a little more. You know, I mean, you know, some of REM stuff could qualify in that, and uh, uh, the Replacements, if they had tuned their guitars better, would probably have been called a power pop band. The Westerberg songwriting was certainly power pop, but they were more punk, I guess, in their approach to it. I wonder how much of that is extra musical. Like, if you trimmed your beard differently and dressed differently, could you be power pop then? Probably. Right, but you're probably spot on about that. And our band, we've never looked, we've never looked any part. I mean, we we I probably got that from Dad too, as far as the <laughs> the session guy aesthetic about it. You know, I mean, we. You know, we've never really looked the part. I mean, I always considered myself a punk rocker, but I've never looked like a punk rocker. So therefore, y'all I'd, have a I'd, y'all I'd, have a certain that. dress to y'all. Y'all look oh, we I mean, we, we're we're well dressed men. I was sure. about to say y'all come up there showing off. Well, yeah, I mean, we don't we don't we don't we don't walk on stage looking <laughs> like shit. You know, we, as we, long we, as you we, don't wear flip flops on stage. No, 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 no. We have like, a very serious. We have a very serious rules about foot about manly footwear is cool. okay good okay good for sure <laughs> yeah, david I, did y'all t- did y'all talk about genre in the studio at all like did things get discussed in terms of that if, like those terms if you've looked at our discography discography you see that we've done everything and uh i mean we started off as a uh, playing behind rhythm and blues black artists mostly uh that's where we started but not long after that a lot of white people wanted to cash in on that, and uh, and then so we've worked. We've done country. We've done jazz. We've we've done everything. I don't consider myself a, a jazz player or, or a country player. I'm a good fake. You know, I'm I'm good at faking different things and uh, making you think that's what I'm doing. Good. Well, I've, I've always believed that good musicians make good music. Yeah. And like Dad how we dress it up. Is... Willie Nelson record. Dad played on my very favorite Willie Nelson record. And Willie Nelson's made what two hundred albums. Oh god! And, uh, but the but the best one, in my opinion, is Phases and Stages, and that's the Muscle Souls Rhythm section. And uh, and that's an, and that's it's one of my top five favorite things Dad's ever played on is that album. Well, there's and, something to be said for musicians who play with each other all the time. You, you yeah. build a trust there that allows you to get the things. That you don't get yeah. to otherwise. We were all good fakes, <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 that's that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's like being a, a character actor or something. 
we can play a lot of different roles and not, not, not necessarily who we are in real life. Uh, I've had some of the people I've worked with say I look like they're a biology teacher uh, <laughs> instead of a rock and roll musician. Well, I have to say, I, like, I play trombone and grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana. As someone who came up in the South wanting to play music that was kind of funky, finding out that, you know, all those Wilson Pickett records were a bunch of guys from Alabama who looked like me made me realize it was possible. <laughs> yeah, I used to play trombone. I played on two million selling records trombone. I knew there was something about him that I liked, Reed. I mean, <laughs> nice, I, yeah, I knew you liked him. <laughs> that's the trombone player on I'm Your Puppet. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, that's like, like that, that iconic trombone. I mean, that's probably the most iconic trombone part in all rock and roll is the is the trombone and I'm Your Puppet. And you were, what, 22? <laughs> when you did that. Yeah, 23, something like that. And uh, and what was the other one? Was it I Never Loved a Man the Way That I Love You by Aretha yeah, Franklin? Yeah, Aretha Franklin, yeah. And I, I was on that record because they couldn't hire the musicians they wanted. <laughs> and so I said, well, I've got a trombone. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I mean. <laughs> great. Yeah. We could probably get several more hours out of the storytelling, but I do want to make sure we hit one more thing. Um, let's talk a, a little bit about the 2020-ness of uh of right now um both patterson and david y'all being on these opposite sides of the industry how has the the whole pandemic scene affected kind of what you do it's it's been horrific it's been a uh you know the walking dead basically for for our industry and uh i mean i just read a saw a thing on facebook today they're what having a benefit for tipitinas this mm -hmm. next week hey, i mean i mean, they are. Like, Same I, mean tips. I mean Tipitina is one of the most important venues in the world, as far as as far as music goes, as far as music venues goes. And uh, I've you know, played there. <laughs> yeah, and and I've played there many times. You know, we were the last band to play there before Katrina. We played there the night before the evacuation, and uh, um, so Tipitina is, is is so near and dear to our heart. And the fact that you know people are having to rally together and i hope they can raise enough money to save it i mean i would like to think they will but a lot of wonderful clubs you know last week the boot and saddle in philly just closed and caledonia and athens georgia which was my home for 21 years and one of the we we made one of our live records partly at the caledonia you know uh, it's one of one of a great you know the little rooms are just dying really fast and yeah. the bigger independently owned rooms are hanging on for dear life and it's it's been horrific and uh I've you know i haven't played it i haven't played a gig since march well since uh, february 29th so have you been doing any sort of like live streaming any of that kind of stuff like how's Just that right, working for you yeah right here where i'm sitting uh right behind where i'm sitting uh, i do a live stream i've been doing it every two weeks since may and it's enabled us to so far hang on to our house and uh and survive by the skin of our teeth but uh but you know that can only go so long too because sure. the the every week it gets a little smaller the take is a little smaller and uh you know and so i don't know how long that's sustainable you know i'm hoping there'll be a, a vaccine readily available enough by sometime next year to where we can start rebuilding our lives but i don't know it's terrifying and the you know the present way the government is right now they are not willing to do shit right now you know do you, do you have any tips on uh time of day format any of those sorts of things on the live stream what, what's been working for you you doing I, facebook or youtube like where are you broadcasting it i'm on a uh i'm on a platform called noon chorus and they were a brand new company when this all all started up and uh they actually just got written up in like i think rolling stone uh yeah there's like a new company that's kind of up and coming and really doing great stuff, but they've done a wonderful job with their tech and and uh, they've worked hard to improve it. As we've gone along, they've been fine tuning stuff on their end. And uh, 
I, Mike Cooley, my partner in the truckers for God, he's, he and I played together for 35 years. We do alternate Wednesdays. So he'd had last week. I have next week. Uh, we're probably going to take a month or two off after Thanksgiving. And uh, we're going to do a Thanksgiving show that everybody in my band is sending in. We're, they're, they're all sending me clips of stuff, and I'm going right. to basically – make a, a variety show out of it and uh and dj it uh the night before thanksgiving and uh, it's on noon chorus and it's up for we keep it up for 72 hours and then after that uh each of us own our own archives and so you know maybe we'll do something with some of that at some point if sure. you now i saw that cooley did a socially distant show at um i think to support the nick because the nick is on the verge of going under have you been able to get any kind of socially distant shows like that in? I know like New Orleans here, they'll do like, uh, they did the like voodoo stuff where they had like the social distant festival, essentially, where like cars would come in and there was like 10 feet away from each car and like a car paid a ticket price. You know, up, I live in the Northwest. And so uh, the, the weather, we've gotten to the point of the year to where you really can't schedule anything outside because right. you just it rains too much and <laughs> it's it's cold and windy every day and uh and then um so i haven't really had anything uh i had a guy who was hiring me to play uh i, I played a party in his driveway a couple of years ago uh, a, a retirement party for a teacher who was retiring in his driveway and he's a sweet great guy he reached out to me to hire me again and we went back and forth and then he quit responding and i was like ah you know i guess he decided not to or whatever and then his family reached out to me and he had died and uh so uh ah. i ended up I ended up playing uh, outside in a park, a memorial for him. I did it. I just did it. I did it actually for free. I, I was like, I just want to come play. And uh, and so I did a memorial for his for him uh, in a park about three weeks ago. But uh, wow. so I'm, 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 you know, I'm uh, so we're pretty locked down out here. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know what y'all did. Wait, y'all did or y'all either are or just did put out a new album, right? We did put out a new record. Yes. We have two brand new records. We yes. kept That's how crazy we are. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, we put out a record called, uh, the new okay. And, uh, which is, uh, after a song I wrote this summer about people say, Hey, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm okay. You know, the new okay. <laughs> and, right. uh, and we had just put out a brand new record when all of this started. We put out a record uh, the last day in January called The Unraveling. Um, our, our titles are pretty. It's a little prescient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we've been we've been telling people we're going to name our next album Free Healthcare and hope <laughs> the world is better. But <laughs> I'm going to have to edit that one. <laughs> <I'm sorry. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> David, are y'all y'all getting much studio work up there? Is the how's the pandemic rolling on that? Well, the problem we're all doing good. We can work, but the people we work with, the artists, are not touring. They're not making any money, so they can't pay us. Uh, that's that's the problem. Uh, like I said, I did a. a uh, William Lee Golden the, uh, of the Oak Ridge Boys. He's 81 or 82 now, but he he was the Oak Ridge Boys haven't been able to play like the drive-by truckers or, or anybody else. Uh, I think they've got a Christmas show coming up at Opryland or somewhere, but uh, in this downtime for him, he decided he would just cut a solo album. And uh, that's, what he's, that's what he did that I did about three weeks ago as I went to Nashville and worked with him on that. But, the people that I work with, since they're not touring and not making any money, they can't hire people like me. And so I've, I've cleaned out. Well, I haven't cleaned out my house, but I've, I've done a lot of stuff around the house. Got my got my 50 year car going again. And, uh, yeah, you got the poodles. Yeah, you got poodles. And I'm surprised I've not seen any poodles. They're right behind me. <laughs> oh, good, good. I've just been crying. There won't be a squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, that's one of been one of the, the moves on all the various Zoom calls we've had to be on over the last few months is uh, if there's a pet in the room, it's totally legit to get them on screen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
We had a girl in my business class this morning giving a presentation and her cat just walks across and just stands right in front of the screen while she's trying to get the presentation. I, I think I know who you're talking about. I've been in some meetings with her. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, cool. I'd like to thank y'all so much. Reed, thank you for hooking this up. Of um, now that we know you come from a deep musical family. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.